Good morning, everybody. We'll just be hanging around here up the top of Bean Hill to get started. So I'm with George today. Hi, George. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We'll do another introduction in a minute as people join. Um, quite a comical start to this live stream is that I've had to jerry rig a, a poor excuse for a microphone. So props to people who do this sort of thing for a living, um, because basically this is our microphone headset with a, with a bandage for a wind baffle and uh, obviously trying to maintain social distancing so we've got to try not to poke George in the face, he's going to hold the top of it when I'm speaking and then when we're not in windy areas hopefully we can just unplug the mic and use the, the phone area at the front. So, <laughs> so good morning to everybody, I see everyone's starting to join in. Do check in um, if you're a regular here, good to see all the friendly faces and names. Good morning Jenny, good morning Leslie. So we're going to kick off in well, a few minutes time. We're just up the top of Bean Hill at the moment. So just for those of you who are um, not perhaps not familiar with the top end of the estate here, uh, this bit is the farm and just beyond that is uh, the wall gardens and then the main Mount Stewart is off behind the trees over there. So. Apologies to everyone with the sound quality. It's going to be a bit of a mixed bag. Like I said, we've got this whole jerry-rigged microphone. So I'm going to hand the microphone to George here, and he's going to try and keep it close to me. And then when he's speaking, he's going to bring it over to him. <laughs> it's all teamwork, isn't it? It certainly is. A bit close to your mouth there, George. <laughs> Aye. It's, all, it's all teamwork. There we go. Radio. Right. So I'm going to unplug it just for a little bit here and just see if we've got any. As the microphone unplugs, now we're in a bit of wind shelter at the moment, um, so it's probably a good chance to talk without having to poke the microphone in each other's faces. Yeah. And uh, well, I suppose best best bet to kick off here is, is I suppose a little bit of an introduction to yourself, George. So who are you? Hi. Well, I'm George Angus. I'm a native of uh, of this area. I was brought up uh, around about maybe five miles away. I was born on a farm. My father was a farmer. Uh, and then when I was uh, maybe a young, the, my father sold the farm. Uh, and then I always said to myself, if I can't farm my own farm, I'll farm somebody else's. And that's when I, I said say that when I was about maybe 10 years of age. Uh, I went to Glastry College and then to Greenmount for two years. And then I started off my work life at Dunleith Estates. And I remember going to interview there and uh, the manager there and says, what's your ambition? And I did say my ambition is to manage somebody else's farm someday. And little did I know I would be. Uh, after three years in Dunleith Estates, the farm manager came in one day to ask me if I would go to Kearney Farm that Dunleith owned to manage a sucker farm. So I went there for up to 1985. And then uh, I got the job here as farm manager from 1985. So all being well, if I'm spared to December of this year, I'll be 35 years here. So I'm part of the furniture. Certainly are. And you've, you've seen just two different owners in that time. So you obviously we're the owners yeah. of the wider domain now as National Trust. Yeah. Um, but pre-2014, it was, of course, Lady Rose and yeah, her estate. Was, uh, Lady Rose was the owner for, uh, for a large number of years when I was here. So I managed the farm for her. And then later on the very last number of years were Lady Rose after Lady Berry died. Of course, yeah, there we go. So, well, three owners then, technically. Three but, owners, yeah. But same property, there you are. Yeah. So, um, so just everyone who's just joined who didn't see the start here, we just stood behind a little bit of a, a, a bush here because mm. it's quite windy up the top of the hill. Um, we've got a little uh, new arrival just around the corner there. Um, so anybody was on uh, this morning's teaser, you can see a week half up the top there. Um, and George is holding our jerry-rigged microphone that we're going to use for when it's windy walking across the fields. So you have to bear with us a little bit, um, just between sort of plugging things in and out and, and I'll have no spare hands and all that sort of thing. But do get your questions coming in. What we're going to do is we're going to take a stroll um, across the top of Bean Hill here, um, down towards the Piggery and then finish up on uh, Bells Hill, Bells Bank and Templefield area. Um, and we'll basically try and answer your questions in between, talk about how farming works in the past and how's farm, farming working now. Um, the biggest change, I suppose, George, is, is that 
with with us as a conservation charity, we've made those big moves towards mm -hmm. a more sustainable farming practice and with a heavy steer on farming for nature. I will. That, that, that is a big change from when I was farming up to 2014 to when the trust took it on. But after saying all that, I think that it's important that farming and nature has to work hand in hand. There's no, no sense in, in nature going in one way and farming going the other. They have to work hand in hand for the benefit of both. Right? That's it, exactly. So, you know, if, if anybody's familiar with habitat types here within the UK and, you know, even globally, a lot of the habitats that are actually now in massive decline are a result of farming, as in they have been lost because of changes in farming practices, but they came about because of man's presence farming the land. So the classic example of this is the, the wildflower meadow. That's a classic hay meadow, um, and that would have been done with usual single hay cuts a year, yeah. maybe two, mm -hmm. winter grazing and so on. But of course, those practices have changed, and we're obviously having to get more and more out of the land with, with more and more inputs as well. But of course, it is a balance, George, you're absolutely right. And, and here's a chance to perhaps look at some of those things where they meet in the middle on our yeah, journey, I'd say. Yeah. So that's probably a good chance. I think that's very important. Yeah, yeah. to make a stroll across. Um, right. So what I'll probably do is I'm going to get the cable. <laughs> so we've got to still maintain our social distance in here and all of that. I'm going to plug the cable in, um, but do let us know on screen. If it gets particularly windy, I'll plug it in and hopefully we can uh, go. But it just seems that the wind has dropped ever so slightly. So I, th I think we'll, we'll try without it to begin with. Um, so I suppose just, we've got a really good 360 view here and for any of the historians up here, I can feel the wind already, there we go. For any of the historians uh, who are familiar with the estate, um, Bean Hill here was, was potentially the proposed site of the house originally. Um, and you can imagine why they would have put it up here. You've got basically straight down views of the lock there, a full 360 degree view all the way around the, the landscape. And of course the farm and this potential site is right in the middle of, of the domain. And, but that didn't happen. So there's a reservoir here instead, or, an, or yep. certainly an old old reservoir tin. Tell, was, us, tell us about that. Yeah. Well, that, this reservoir was, was not working in my day. Uh, the idea was to pump all the water up to high places in the farm. And there's a lot of tanks and places in the farm. So then the gravity fed into the lower parts of, of the fields. So that, that was why this was here, and that was it fed in through all the lower pits right out, out round. Uh, and that's how the, the water, the fields in them days. That's it. So, of course, you know, no good mains pressure like we get now. We get about eight bar coming into the state. It is. Very good, <laughs> very good mains here, like definitely is. And we notice it yeah. when we've had a few water cuts in the past, um, having to get the bowsers out, and the cattle will go Aye. through a, yeah. a thousand litre bowser in no time. So well, Now the dry weather, the cattle do drink a lot of water, like. Uh, yeah. So that's a good chance. We'll, we'll head across the field here and George, if you want to tell us about what's in this field and what makes it slightly different from perhaps uh, a normal uh, field. Well, the, this field here at the present time is the spring barley. This was sown around about three weeks ago. Uh, it's coming up reasonably well. The only thing I would say is just a lack of moisture because here you still see there are some lime sown on this field and some fertilizer and it's still sitting on top that it's not washed in yet because of the lack of moisture. But the, 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 the plants are coming up and they're just reasonably well. Uh, this is a spring barley crop and on the edges of all the spring fields and the crops this year we have put a two metre margin of uh, wild farm meadow right round each field. So uh, it should be a good job of uh, So, I mean, things got a really good start with the warm days. It's still been pretty chilly at night, perhaps up until maybe last night, I suppose, really. Yeah. And, and it is, aye. Yeah, it was. Uh, last night was warm now. This area here, we're, we're trying the far side of this field. There, 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 is a, there is a wee lane down in between here. And this far side was sown in spring barley as well. But it is under sown uh, with herbal lay, which is a grass base. Uh, with herbs in it, herbal lay. So this is something new that we're trying this year uh, is the herbal lay and we have four fields of it going in this year and all different ways of putting it into the ground and this is uh, under sown which means it's, it's put onto a crop and then it's sowed with the crop 
to get it established so when the when the spring barley is cut off it in August, September time, the herbal ale will be underneath and be ready to go. Great, so it's like two birds, one stone, which I always sort of say is a bit of a bad analogy for working in conservation, but uh, <laughs> it's one of those things. So we're just coming up to um, well, what's the edge of the old ha ha wall um, that surrounds Bean Hill and one of the shelter belt screens that just spurs out from Farm Lane there. Um, and it's nicely calmed down out of the wind again as well. So we've got a, we're gonna go, are we going through the rotten moss field? Might as well go straight across to the figure, or should we go through the lane? What do you think? No oh, way. <laughs> okay. So most of the bulls are fairly uh, fairly docile here, but um, you don't want to take chances. <laughs> Thank you, George. So something I've noticed this last uh, week or so, um, going by previous years, um, a little bit behind, but all the dragonflies and damselflies are starting to hatch out from the lake. And what happens is they tend to come out to these fields and the field margins here. And whenever we walk down here, you quite often see all of the common blue and um, the uh, red data uh, dragonflies and damselflies. You, do you ever notice them, George? Or are you I too busy on your missions? There, there, there are. Well, I, I, I normally look at the cattle rather than that, I tell you the truth. Uh, but it is it's a wee bit late this season. If you look at grass growth and the chart of grass growth, it is about a fortnight behind what it was average. Uh, and it hasn't peaked the way it should have peaked. Uh, last year was an exceptional year for grass. Uh, it was one of the, I say, the best grass year I have ever known. Uh, and then the year before, if you think back to 2019, and it was a very, very dry summer. And all these fields here were just like a was very, very poor. It was around the July time. Yeah. So I'm getting a few comments here that the wind is a bit windy here. So I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll just plug it in until we get into the woods here. Um, it's amazing how much wind noise the, the phone picks up here, but this jerry rig thing, not bad, not bad. I think it's it's not bad. A bit of MacGyver work here, so I'll just plug in. Okay, so you'll probably be able to hear me here really well, and there'll be a bit of a delay between me going to hand over to George there um, to speak as well. Right, uh, there we go. Right, so, so we're actually walking along the... Well, one of the original drives that went up to the farm before the farm lane was built. Mm -hmm. It did. I yes, it was it was an hour lane than than what it is now. Uh, but when we were fencing it, we decided to just make it a bit broader. And the rough ground that you see we're walking on at the minute uh, it was a, a new water line went down here uh, just a number of months ago. I'm also looking through. Um I'm not getting a chance to kind of shout out as many people as uh, normally, and I've just forgotten that I've not not got the mic next to me, so there we go. Um, good to see uh, people joining us uh, from all over the place, actually. Um, get my rubbish little gimbal level, there we go. So here at Mount Stewart, um, National Trust themselves aren't farmers, and we do all of our farming through tenants, although there are some in-hand farms around. Uh, Northern Ireland and England and Wales, um, but we could not do what we do without our tenant farmers, and we're basically striking a balance between their business needs and, and sort of our conservation aims. And generally, it works, doesn't it, George? What's your take on it, having been both sides of the the coin? I well, well, I think I think we're very fortunate here at Mount Stewart. The, the tenants that we have are very, very much in line with our thinking, uh, and they're yes, yeah, so they're, they're with us now five years and they've still stayed the same, and there, it's been a very, very positive relationship. I think the important thing is having a good relationship with the tenants. If you haven't got that, they'll, you, that they'll not work with you, by, and vice versa. Yeah. I'd say that's probably a mantra for just life in general. Yeah. Oh, it is. It does, I. Yeah. So, who have we got here, George? This is a, a shorthorn bull from one of the tenants, and this boy here is called James. I don't know why he's called James. I think it was uh, one of the, my grandson named him James. So uh, he's about six years old, uh, and we'll be seeing his sons and daughters uh, later on. Uh, he's very docile uh, and throws a very, very good calf now, and uh, he's done a good job so far. Yeah. So, so tell us, why has um, the the tenant who's 
don't mind me saying, is obviously your son as well. Yeah. So he's farming on the consent. So he um, he started to move his herd to a shorthorn herd. So what's the benefits of using a shorthorn breed? Well, we, we, well first of all, he, he wanted a, a, a suckler herd that is easy calving. Uh, and he, he, he's looked at different breeds uh, over the years and he, he's, he's picked this shorthorn breed. And it's, it suits us very, very well here at Mount Stewart because they're very docile. And with people and the public walking around, you don't want a, a very uh, a ragged up herd <laughs> like, you know, so uh, they're, they're very docile uh, and they're easy at calving and they're easy at finishing. Shorthorns are very easy and they're, they're a native breed too as well now. So that's it. So it's keeping some of those heritage breeds going. Now, whilst James here is a bit of a brute, generally the, the cattle themselves are perhaps a little lighter footed on the ground. Oh, they are. They are. They're, 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 they're lighter. And that's what he wants to uh, have a, a smaller cow producing a calf rather than a great big cow. For, it takes more grass for them. Uh, so a smaller cow is more economical. And of course, one of the big challenges around um, running a beef herd or a dairy herd is, is, is this whole thing around having to house them for a quite a long period of time. So with the short horns, they don't they can mostly be out all winter. Well, it depends on on the weather they can, and that's that's what he would like to do is a, a, a grass based herd, which is out wintered a good bit or else inside, but just fed on silage. So there's little inputs put into them. So this really suits us here at Mount Stewart because um, we need quite a few of our field systems to be grazed in winter just to get some of the, the perhaps ranker grass down. So people who've been out with um, some of my other clips that you will have seen um, talking about sort of the rank grass that grows up and it tends to smother out some of the smaller sort of more delicate flower species that obviously all the pollinators and the insects like. But okay, so so we've got on the other side in the rotten moss field here, this is another tenant's herd. So tell us about that one. Yeah, this, this, this is... When, when we were wanting herds, we wanted to, the tenants to be a variety of farmers through the area. So this tenant here is, is a dairy farmer from just outside Belly Halbert. And he brings in his, uh, his Frisian heifers here. The, these heifers, I presume, are around about a year and a half to coming up to two year old. And these here will be calving roughly around Christmas time, starting to calve around Christmas time. Yeah, they're a nice looking bunch of heifers now. So they're pretty clean, aren't they? Looking really yeah. good. Yeah. So uh, they just out on this field, what, a couple of weeks ago? Was they're it? a couple of weeks ago. He's, he is feeding some sideies to them just to, to supplement the grass at the present time. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you don't know, these are heifers. Heifers are the names given to female cattle that aren't calved yet, that haven't produced a calf yet. And as soon as they produce a calf, they have been known as cows. <laughs> Simple. So everyone's getting a little bit of an insight. Now, I know that we have quite a few followers, visitors, watchers that are probably farmers themselves. I think everyone knows a farmer in Northern Ireland. I totally find we're, you know, it's quite a rural community overall. Um, so shout out to the farmers. Like, you know, these guys are still working constantly under the current circumstances. You know, life goes on, business goes on. And we still need to make sure that the food systems are working for us here in the UK and Ireland as well. So, so yeah, I think you know that's worth saying. I think I think it is, and uh, maybe I'll just give a plug, you know, because it is very, very important farmers to survive. They have to meet, put meat on the table and have to be make a living like everybody else. And they don't know from one month to the next what they're getting, you know, for whether it's milk or beef or sheep or whatever. Uh, so I think it's important that we all who live here have a role to play because we can buy local uh, and don't don't go and buy meats that are bringing in from other countries because here is is, is good it's 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 traceability uh, it's healthy and it's good so uh, buy local if you can uh, which is very very important uh, this field here just behind us maybe Toby would. I'll tell you what, George, we'll just step inside the woodland edge because then I think we can get the other microphone on the go and it shouldn't be quite so windy. So that should, should be a, a better sound now. We, 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 we see two fields here at the minute and these are both in Herbal Lay. The far field is in Herbal Lay. Uh, it was sown in the 27th of September and it was sown... Uh, it was just disc straight into stubble 
uh, and we tr tried that to see how it would go in, in the autumn time. And this field here close to us was ploughed and cultivated and just put straight into herbal lay. And the field where James the bull was lying, half of that was stitched into herbal lay. So we have four different methods of putting in herbal lay and we will, some will work and some will not work, uh, but we'll try it and see what it, what it, how it'll go. So when you say stitching, George, just for people who don't know the farming terminology. Aye, well stitching is, is, is not ploughed or, or, or cultivated in any way. It's run over with a hara and sowed at the same time and then just rolled into grass. The grass was et off as much as possible, uh, so it gives the best chance for the herbal lay seed to, to germinate. So we've just got a few questions coming in from some people who perhaps joined a little later on. They're asking what's a herbal lay? So if you want to give us a Aye. give us a 30 second rundown roughly Good of what question. that is. Good question. Herbal lay is a grass, all grasses, which is even this here is perennial. So per uh, perennial means constantly growing. It doesn't yep. grow and then die like an animal. No, no, no. It? It's constantly growing. And all grasses are basically, all the fields are in grass are basically perennials. And herbal lays, there is a certain amount of perennial in it, but also herbs as well. When the herbs are deep rooting plant, if you if you take the perennial grass, the the the, the roots would only go into the soil that much. And so when it's a dry summer, these roots cannot get the moisture, and that's why fields are burned up. The herbs in the fields here, the herbal lays, they are deep rooting. Some of them would be as much as maybe two feet into the ground which opens up the soil, which they can extract the, the moisture from deep within the soil so it stays green and stays growing right out through the year. Also, there's a lot of clover in it, which draws the nitrogen out of the air and puts into the plant so there's less bag stuff put into it. And that's the big thing that we are trying to, so less fertilizer put on the ground, but at the same time getting production and also good for wildlife as well. So that's it. So so in a roundabout way, I mean, it, a lot of people may have heard of things like no-till or reduced till, um, mm -hmm. so like turning of the land. So this is a way, one, to sort of avoid having to turn the soil too much, which saves on fuel costs for a start, which is great. But also, like, like George says, it's drawing up uh, nutrients and water from deeper down in the ground. So it's a more sustainable crop that can tolerate, I suppose, these, these increasing frequency of stream, extreme weather I, I think, I think getting... generally farmers today realize that you know the most important commodity they have isn't the machinery or, or even their livestock on the farm the most important commodity they have is what they're standing on is what we're standing on is the soil is the ground That's and it. it's important yeah. that we have to look after the soil and if we look after it it'll look after us as, as farmers wise words wise words indeed so We'll head on through the woods here, um, but I just thought I'd sort of round up. A lot of people have asked about the, the field names that are around Mount Stewart. So, so we're here in, in what's known as the water park fields. Um, these ones, it's, it's, they then became sort of the paddocks during the stud field times. But, all, all, all this area in the, in the mid 80s, uh, mid 50s was fenced, and we'll see maybe some of the fencing uh, off studs. There was a stud here. And all them there were were all stud fenced uh, for for horses. So so yeah. So I think the, if I remember right, the fencing was a birthday gift for. It was uh, a birthday Lady gift for Lady Bury in 1955, and then I was told it cost ten thousand pounds. So 1955, ten thousand pounds for a birthday gift. That was good now. Yeah. <laughs> so how the other half lived, indeed. So um, we'll take a stroll on through the woods here. Um, George, do do tell us if you know. Well, there's quite a few names around the estate. Obviously, they they go right the way back, and probably some of them actually originate from before the domain as we know it today was created. But do you have any idea where some of those names might come from? So we've got like Burby's Ground, Gervin's well, I, I, Ground. I presume some of them were were the original where they purchased the ground from. Maybe there are small holdings, and maybe there were called. We we have we have the flush field. We have Burberries. We have Stuarts, we have Cummings, we have Bells, uh, we have Gervins. Uh, so I presume there, there may be small holdings where they, all the land was purchased from and they just kept the, maybe the name of that person there and that's how they got the field names. Yeah. I remember um, quite a few years ago now when I was working on the North Coast, um, 
there was the Causeway Coast and Glens Heritage Trust uh, commissioned a townlands and field names study. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, sort of, they delved into the origins of this, that, yeah. and the other, and this stream was called this, and, and all sorts of things. But yeah, it's quite, quite a, quite a long, long sort of winded history. Anyway, so we're just passing through Piggery Woods here. Um, so on my right, uh, heads up onto New Hill. Um, so that's where like the natural play area is and everything. On my left is what what we call sort of Piggery Woods, although Piggery Old Woods, because this is probably the best example of, of the closest thing we got to some ancient woodland. And I, I guess you guys can probably just see the bluebells are are in through there as well. We'll see them a little bit more. And of course, obviously it was a real shame that we weren't able to be open while these things were at their full height, but you can still see the they are there, they're just heading over now. They actually went over very quickly. Um, oh, they did this year now. So yeah, that's yeah. a testament to sort of the very warm day weather. There you go, you can sort of see quite a few more there. Yeah, there we go, look at that. Of course, the, the, the quality of the live stream feed is only what, like 480p, so you don't get any high definition or anything, but you can see the difference between both sides of the woods. So, so here on the right hand side, it's just a little bit more in shade. And so they come on a little later. So these guys are maybe like five days past their best. I would be. I Whereas you look on the, the left hand side, and uh, this is a bit more of a sort of sunny gl gl glade, a sunny bank. And they're just a little bit further on, like good. Yeah. You can just see there. So they pretty much just come to the end of their flowering stalks there and turning over. So, probably a good opportunity before we step out into the wind. It shouldn't be too windy up here. Um, but we'll just pick up a, a few few of the questions. Jimmy says, are there still a few weird a wee deer running wild in the estate? So, Mount Stewart was never a deer park, no, which is no. interesting, even no. though considering it was it's a walled domain, which yeah. a lot of people think, well, maybe it was. Um, no, it was never a deer park. However, there are a few sort of escapees from various collections around the... Uh, peninsula that have arrived here. Um, a quite invasive species called a, a muntjac. Um, so they have to be dealt with pretty quick because um, you can imagine what they would do if they got into the gardens here. So we've got a few other questions as well. Uh, so Colin Johnson says, how many acres are in the property? We'll probably divide it up between farmland and woodland. Well, the, the total that was inside the walls is just short of a thousand acres. And there is 400 and just over 400 acres of farmland, so uh, that's what so that's what the farmland is. 400 acres inside the walls, and the rest is woodlands. I think there's 120 acres or so to the gardens. Yeah, I think that's that's about right. And then the rest would be everything from small pockets yeah. of woodlands, the plantation woods, um, laneways, and and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So, I'll sort of pick up a few more here because it's it's dead still here. Aye, it's lovely. <laughs> So I'm just picking up. So Pauline asks, uh, da, 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 da. let's see, with COVID-19 uh, during the time we're closed, will members get a refund? Just wondering. So there's loads of information on our website about that. So if you just pop up National Trust, go to the membership portal and all the information will there about that sort of thing. But we would take the opportunity to say is that, you know, we're a membership based organisation and we can't do what we do without members. So thank you to everyone who are members and, and their support. Um, I know it's 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 not just about entry to these places, but we look after. Um, well, I think it's about seventy percent of all our land holdings are open space, free for access for anyone, whether you're a member or not. It still costs money to look after these places to maintain the access on them and do the work that we do. So yeah, thank you so much for being a member. And um, yeah, I can't say that enough. I think I've probably said that in every yeah. <laughs> every live stream I've been in. And, and of course to our volunteers as well that, that give us their time and skills. I know everyone's itching to get back to our places. So, uh, right, where are we at? We are here on Bell's Bank, um, just up here. And then we've got Patterson's Hill there. There's the Glen, and that's Bell's Tank, because you can see the tank on the top. So tell us a little bit about this area, and then of course the herd that's here. Oh, well, I would say this is one of my favorite areas on this state up here. I think it's just Rome. It's, it, it shows very well the drumlins off County Down. Uh, and you see the tank up in the, up on top of the hill there? As I said, that was, there was a pumping station just over a bit, and it was uh, pumped up, and then that was gravity fed all the water down this area. This flat bit in between the two drumlins, as we see here, where the cows are grazing, this was a, an airstrip at one time. This is where Lady 
Lady Burry uh, flew there as her plane from. Uh, she landed and took off here. And just at the other end is the old hangar site, of the course, hangar as well. Site, you yeah. can see the, the concrete pad still there. Uh, this is where they the flew the plane from. She was a accomplished pilot, I believe. I never sat with her, uh, <laughs> and I wouldn't have done so if, if it had to be truthful. <laughs> Uh, so it had been, it'd been a hairy landing now and even uh, and taken off too. So if anybody can hear the water in the background, it's not because there's a toilet here. <laughs> the uh, the cattle and their drinker are just over there. So you can see them getting a good old uh, drink there. And of course, all, all these uh, cows are with calf and uh, got them suckling away. So they take a drink and a little break away and you can just make out the calves in the sort of distance here. So we'll, we'll take a stroll on round um, and have a look at them. But um, as you can see, the, the field here has been sort of divided up into like temporary paddocks. So why do we do that? Well, it's just to neutralise the grass more. If you imagine if the M stock were left into the old field, there'd be more trampling of, of grass. So, and it's healthier for the grass if it's head off and then up again. And it means it's healthier for, for the livestock. They're getting fresh, fresh grass every, every about four or five days at the present time. It's like us, if we were sat down to a plate and just get the same food all the time and stale, you always want fresh food and it's the very exact same for, for livestock. That is it. So another question, and just um, Victoria's asking to tell us a bit more about the drumlins. So, so for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with the geology, um, drumlins are basically like hillocks or hills. Um, these are particularly big drumlins um, in, on the Arts Peninsula and these are basically the remnants of the retreating ice sheets um, during the glacial age. So basically as those ice sheets ground their way down from the north to the south, you know, we're talking close to a mile thick of an ice sheet, they would grind up and pick up all sorts of things from the bedrock and the ground and then of course as they retreated they would melt and drop all of those particulates and these form these sort of quite quite clayey um, sort of deposits, aren't they? Yeah, and that's yeah. probably what makes uh, the farmland here so rich. I, the, the, no, the, the land here is, is good farmland, a bit stony, and that's why, because of the, of the deposit of the stones down here. Uh, when it's ploughed and all, you wonder where the stones all come from. There's, every year, you, if you plough it, there's big stones come up, <laughs> and they just come up to the surface. Uh, but no, it, it, it is good farmland, uh, it is indeed. Yeah. And of course the other aspect of this is because we're also sat on part of a raised uh, beach line obviously with the, the Strangford Lock just over the hill here, you also have big sandy bands in there as well. So it can change from sort of one metre to two metres of a field into from clay to sand sometimes. Yep, yep. So tell us a little bit about, about what's going on here because a lot of people have sort of wondered well, why these strips here and, and regular walkers on this bit of the red trail will remember sort of summer, summer sunflowers and yeah. linseed and millet and cornflower and stuff. Well, this, this, when again, when we fenced this here around about 2015, uh, we knew the public would be walking through here and the hedges were tight into this roadway. But we decided to set the, the fences back into the fields to give the sense of wide open spaces. So this on the right hand side here is, uh, is some herbal lay. Uh, with uh, wildflower mixes in it. So we've got a bit, of, a bit of knapweed coming up there. There's some um, umbellifer of some kind. I can't remember the full mix. That's, I think that looks like kidney vetch, possibly. Uh, yeah, uh, there's chicory in here. I think that's chicory there. That's chicory, which is generally, if you see that there out there of chicory, the root is a much the same depth underneath the ground. So you can understand why this will grow when uh, it's a drought situation. So we've barely had any rain for close to sort of eight, There's nine weeks. It was, there was a bit of a skiff last yeah, night, but yeah. as you saw in the field earlier on, um, it was pretty dusty. So yeah. these guys are romping away here. Uh, uh, so and this, this, is, this is red clover. Uh, clover is a very, very important source of, of uh, nitrogen into the ground. Uh, and there's a lot of white and red clover. You see the, the red clover just coming up through here, right? Uh, and it's very good for, for, for the bees and, and the flies and such. So, but it's also, it's like a dessert to the cows and mm -hmm. calves. You know, we all like desserts, especially I do. And that's just like a dessert to them, like, you know. Because I remember when um, Bell's Bank here got sown 
Now that was 2016, that was, that, was it? This was sown out in grass in 2015. And it had what? Um, it was a, I can't remember the mix of the clover that went into it, but it, it rocketed away, didn't it? Well, uh, normally uh, when you're sowing out into grass, there's uh, 13 kilos roughly to, to, to the acre. Uh, and about a half a kilo of white and half a kilo of red is mixed into it. But I thought, well, we're going to try it out here. So I put three kilos of white and three kilos of red into the mix, which is, oh, six times what it was recommended. And I thought I did overdo it, but it came away very, <laughs> very well. Certainly and did, it, yeah. It, it's lasted well now. Uh, and it's, it's done very well. And it's a great grazing field. Absolutely marvellous. It really is. And I remember um, certainly towards the, the sort of top side of the field there, we are getting a little bit of sort of erosion. It was getting a little bare where it was sort of rinsing off a few times. So it was definitely needed to go into pasture at that point, didn't yeah. it? So here's uh, the rest of uh, Alan Angus's herd. Right. This, is, this is some of the herd that these calves were born over the last three, four weeks. Some of them were only a week old. Uh, and if it, they're, they're a bit of a mixture of breeds of, of the cows, but he's generally moving into the red and white ones. That red and white one over there is, is a heifer that's coming this year. And this one here is a second calver. And th this is what he's, he's aiming for. That size of a cow there, that red and white one there. That's, so it's, that's it's, the size. It's quite hard to get scale here. So mm -hmm. just in comparison, say, to the dairy, the Frisian heifers that were up there. So they'd probably be maybe, what, 15% bigger? They would what, be. Generally? I, well, especially them heifers there, when they come in to mature the cows, they, they will be a, a, a big cow. Uh, and... There's, there's some very big cows in here as well, but he'd been moving away from them and moving into that sort of size of cow. Enough of milk for a calf and produces a very good calf. That is ultimately what we're trying to get to here. Yeah, I'm just zoomed in on the, the wee white one just yeah. there. <laughs> I tell you, he's a heat and he'll, he'll be beefing up. And how long roughly would that take from from sort of, uh, well, calf to, to harvest? I suppose it depends on the market to a point, It depends it? on the market, but roughly Alan would like to, to beef these in around about 18 months, uh, if possibly. Uh, maybe take longer and sometimes shorter. It just depends on the animal as well. Too. So yeah. I've had a few questions already just about, obviously, you know, is, is, it, is it all beef and cattle here, um, which... Probably must have joined just a little bit Aye. before we got no, going the, there. The 400 acres are split up into 60% in grass and 40% in cereals. And them cereals again are split up into uh, some spring and some winter cereals. So, winter cereal means it's sown in the winter time, spring cereal means it's sown in the springtime. Uh, and then it's harvested at the same time, roughly August and September. So one of the important things about having a mixed um, farming system here for, from our point of view as a conservation charity is that arable fields provide a really important food source for a lot of the overwintering and migratory bird species that arrive here. Um, so I'm just thinking of some of the species that people might be familiar with, like some linnet. Um, some of those might visit garden bird feeders as well. And we have a, we had, uh, not this winter, but the winter before, this this whole uh, bird cover strip that um, was sown through here um, and then our other arable fields had it was a flock about 180 to 200 strong of linnet on there of course we even get the likes of the grey lag geese coming in and having a bit of a forage in the in the pastures as well over winter so we'll just have a look at that bird cover because let's say this side was the um, one of the lay and flower mix went went into this side and the other side is more specifically for that, that cereal element so the seed crop that comes um, usually so it's flowering late late July August yeah, but the important thing is August the seeds time. isn't it uh, and here there, there, there's three three cereal crops in this mix uh, trick of kale uh, oats and barley so and we can along we can... with that there we, we have some there coming up through the sunflower we put I put sunflower in along with it as well so they're they're coming up I was just over it the other day there I was very well pleased with germination of sunflower that's it last, last year wasn't very very good last yeah. year they they got, it was a really dry period again just yeah. as it's sown so it's not a moment too soon to get a bit of a rain on this but you can yeah. see the barley's well up it's, it's 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 done very well and then there's also linseed in among it as well and that's the favourite of those yeah. small finch bird species that absolutely love this and of course it then sits as uh, sort of basically 
Was it till winter effectively? It was only it, it only went fine. in and yeah. went reseeded a couple of weeks ago, really. Yeah. Um, now I know Gillian was just looking back through the comments. Gillian commented on that's a very nice hedgerow here, and of course she helped plant some of this hedgerow. Um, so this this was one of the one of the things when we were were starting with the sort of our program of of I guess I guess changing the land used to be a bit more sustainable, helping to reconnect habitats out here. Um, one of the things about Mount Stewart is, is it's got some really good corridors of woodland and things like that, but from, from the middle of the estate to the south of the estate down here, there are only two corridors of woodland. There's one just over the hill here, and then the other one's about, what, two kilometres yeah, that way yeah. um, over here, and there's nothing in the middle. Um, and of course, normally, in, in certainly in the, the, the Island of Ireland landscape, you've got lots of hedgerows and things that connect things, and it's unusual to have such big expanses of field systems and if you ever look on any of the maps of the area and, and outside of Mount Stewart you can still see there's quite a lot of small field oh, systems yeah, yeah. and then here in Mount Stewart it was all about this design vista with this you know the big I mean I call Bell's Hill when you don't uh, sorry Bell's Tank when you don't see the tank on top of it looks like the old Windows 95 background oh, yeah. <laughs> so so one of the things we made a decision was was just to um, knit quite a thick old hedgerow in between the, the glen there and piggery woods and and this is about you know a corridor it, it connects these parts of the woodlands together it's also a corridor for all those bugs beasties birds and so on they then have the opportunity to spill out into the fields and of course uh this probably nicely segues onto what's going on up in temple field yeah, actually yeah, yeah. yeah. so we'll, we'll yeah. move forward a little bit so yeah. so as those corridors of of uh habitat help help the the bugs and the beasties work their way out through and then of course out into the fields where they can do their thing, uh, staying on top of all the problem species like green fly and um, was it, what's the other, the, there's a beetle isn't it that affects um, barley, I can't remember its name, do you remember that one George? Uh, I, well, uh, here's a test. <laughs> there is, there is, there is a beetle, I was going to do it off the top of my head, forget about it, but, uh, yeah so if, if, if we can plant stuff around the edge rows to help to protect the crops so reduce the spray on it that's what we're trying to do whether it works or not is another thing but <laughs> at least we have to try it and see and that, that's the way forward on it and i think this is the thing is that you know mount stewart was a, a model farm in its original establishment and you know they were pushing the sort of the, the the advancement in the forefront of agriculture and I mean ironically a lot of the techniques that are employed in, in sort of more sustainable farming now are some of the old techniques but with a modern twist. Yeah I, I, if, if, you, if you look at farming we're, we're, we're going back to nature but also just to incorporate everything in together you know and some some of the old things are coming back in to you know we need more fibre in, in the, into, into the feedstuff for the cattle uh, so yeah, we 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 it's went too far one way, and I think now we're pulling back the other way as well now. That's it, and you know, like like everything, and I've talked about striking a balance enough, probably from my role as a ranger and, and sort of the the visitor access and conservation side of things. So you know, farming nature's also balanced there too. You know, it has really good benefits, but of course, if as long as it's done in in a yeah. balance and in the right way. So we're just passing by, all, all the calves are up this end of the paddock. <laughs> They're all just chilling. They're always really interested in what's going on, though. <laughs> so, so yeah, we're talking about corridors. Um, so we're just heading off. Um, so we've got Bell's Bank to the side of us. And just beyond this is the Temple Field. So this is one of the, probably the, almost the biggest field it system, is, isn't it? It is the biggest field in, in the state. There's 36 acres on it. Uh, when I came here first, that was it was all divided off into stud paddocks, and there were seven stud paddocks in it, about five acres each. Uh, so we'll, we'll see the remnants of the old fence, as I said later on here. But it's the biggest field, uh, uh, it's the flattest field we would have on the estate. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a good field to work with machinery. And I think that's the biggest change, one of the biggest changes I've seen over my time in farming is is that machinery's got bigger and bigger and more powerful uh, and more expensive as well. You know, I remember it, I bought a tractor in 2004 here, uh, cost 21,000. Uh, Lady Burry thought it was a wild money in them days. <laughs> that same tractor today is 80 to 100,000 pounds. And that's one of the smaller models. And that's well, a small <laughs> model. I, I, 
you know, it was 120 horsepower. Now there's tractors 200, 250 horsepower. Just more power and get things done quicker. Uh, but still, farmers have no time. Still, still running. You know, that, that's the way life is. Although we've slowed down with the. Over 19, I think we've all slowed down now. Yeah, and it's a chance just to reflect a little bit as well, probably. Well, well I yeah. mean, what's your personal take on on sort of the current situation? It's it's been an interesting time for, for me to say the least. But what's Aye. your take as as a ranger, as a farmer, as as you know, someone who's in the internet, and of course, someone who lives and breathes like the the local arts area? Aye, well, well, I think it's uh, it's been a very interesting time, a uh, very concerning time uh, for everybody. I think in farming, I don't think farmers seen much different because farming has to go on, no matter what. They're they they're still up the same day. They haven't they have been self isolating on a tractor rather than <laughs> in their household. Uh, they have still to keep the the food coming out to the population. For farm for families, I think it's been a maybe a positive attitude because they have spent more time together. Uh, maybe couples have spent more time together. Maybe some couples think that's too bad, too good, <laughs> or too bad. Uh, but uh, going forward, I would just hope that we, as a population, take the good bits out of the self-isolating bit and put it into what's going to be our normal. That's it—the that's the new point. normal, isn't the it? The new normal. Yeah. Take what's good that we have learnt and put it into the new normal. And of course, you know, this is a time where we're, you know, here in Northern Ireland. For those of you who aren't. Um, in Northern Ireland, of course, we're still under pretty much all of the restrictions. They were, yeah. Some of them were just eased yesterday. Um, so it's like likes of garden centres are open and people can meet outside. But most of those outside places, like ourselves here at Mount Stewart, are still under restriction to stay closed. Um, and of course, you know, we've been working in the background for the last couple of weeks to what reopening will look like. Um, and of course, we can only do what we can do as long as government instruction says we can basically so i know a lot of you have been asking you know when are we opening we're almost ready but we still have to adhere to any stipulations that uh, the government obviously says and rightly so you know at the end of the day we need to make sure that we're looking after our staff here as well as the visitors that come here too um so so getting back on track yeah. <laughs> um you can see here so this is a temple field we're talking so you can see it's a pretty nice flat field and you can just see there's a strip um, just through the middle of it. So tell us a little bit about that one, George. Well, this field is sowed into spring wheat. Uh, and a tenant takes this here for whole crop silage. This will not be harvested with a combine and straw and all that. This is taken for to make silage for their, his dairy cows. Uh, so this will be cut round about August time. And we we'll tried a new thing this year. And you see that bare strip along the it looks bare anyway at the present time. It was only sold there about 10 days ago and it's in, into an insect seed variety so that it attracts the insects. And the idea is that it will grow up and the insects that would attack the crop will be sucked into this here and fed into this here. So it will be a benefit for the insects and also a benefit for the, ins for the farmer so that he'll have to spray less in, in the fields. And of course, all general... This is a general principle, principle, yeah. So, of course, this is all based on what the current population is within a given area anyway, of course. So the other benefit of this is that, obviously, all the existing predatory insects that prey on the problem insects, mm -hmm. they have a chance to basically get their corridors in there. And, of course, they'll go in and start nibbling and eating and yeah. pred predating on all of those problem issues that would normally be an issue for the crop itself. So uh, around, around the edges of this field, there's a six-metre grass field margin as well. So... Here's, I mean, people will have seen on my Twitter feed last week that announced that we're really, really, really happy to have a breeding pair of barn owls. Um, have got three chicks currently on, on the estates, which is fantastic. Um, and of course, those margins, those rough margins, and of course, the, the, the arable crop, they provide lots of little bits of food source and shelter for all those small mammals, which of course, the likes of the barn owl hunt on. Um, so, so. I mean, I, I've been out here in the evenings and I've heard the barn owls sweep. Well, they don't hear them sweeping, but you certainly hear them screeching right. uh, when they're calling to each other. It is, it's, you know, it's another, it's another great win there, you know, and, and this is all part of that sort of knock-on mechanism. If we can get the plant life right and the soil health right, everything works all the way up through the food chain, in theory. <laughs>
So maybe you zoom into that. You see the old fence down. Oh there? yeah, yeah. That is the the old stud fence. That's the last bit remaining, and I would like to just keep that and well improve <laughs> on it, but but keep it just for a for posterity. Point yeah, of yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there was there was acres and acres of this, and it's it's oh, in, there, in... There, there's miles <laughs> of that in, in the place. So we, we had to, that was one of the other big change since the trust took over. We decided we have to fence everywhere to keep the public and the stock separated. You know, it doesn't do with the livestock walking through, uh, the public walking through livestock. So we, over the last five years, I suppose we have fenced around about 20,000 metres of fencing. There's been a lot of boundary fence. Uh, of I'm just, I'm just looking, there's a buzzard um, just circling around there and it's, it's sort of being pestered by a hooded crow as well. So they're just starting to rise up on the thermals of the morning. There we go. So there's a couple of breeding pairs of buzzards on the estate, along with sparrow hawks and long-eared owls and things like that as well. But yeah, yeah. So, so you know, if we're talking about sort of where where does where does membership money go? Um, you know, obviously it looks after all of our built heritage, which are absolute money pits, and I'll I'll happily say that as a ranger because you know the countryside in terms of what we do out here is you know it goes a long way where uh, your membership contributions here. Um, so one of the direct obvious ones, of course, is is boundary maintenance pathway maintenance things like that but then we've also got the likes of, of pursuing our research projects that help inform things and of course at the moment under the current farming climate farming for nature isn't very well supported um, and the agricultural yeah. bill went up for um, amendment review yeah. last week and unfortunately one of the most important amendments I was quite disappointed to see didn't go through was was about supporting local and British produce so it's basically undercut the entire UK farming industry by opening it to poor quality welfare um, imports. Uh, it's, just, it's just it's just at the minute it's very it's just on very uncertain time uh, for farmers at the at the minute. You know the COVID nineteen has reduced the price of beef and reduced the price of milk uh, because the restaurants aren't open, the hotels aren't open, so they're not using the, the same amount of stuff. So it's a very very uncertain time for farmers and and with Brexit you know going out of, of Europe. Uh, it's just a very, very uncertain time for them. So, so that's why, you know, we always say, we're, I mean, we're apolitical as an organisation, so we don't stand with any left, right, whatever it is, any party, but we do stand for what we do stand for as a conservation body. Um, and when it comes to land outdoors and nature and, and looking after the, the wider environment, you know, this this is the long term challenge and the long term issue. Farming's part of that and farming's also part of the solution. Oh, yeah. So, so, so yeah, I mean, have a look at the agricultural amendment bills that are going through at the moment. Um, the actual agricultural bill in its entirety is looking pretty good. There's just a few of these uh, amendments which were perhaps a little disappointed haven't haven't gone through. Um, but but in, in principle, the agriculture bill will be supporting farmers basically to produce public goods. So they will actually be supported to make more of this happen. You know, more of these like wildlife friendly and, and farming for nature and more sustainable approach. So so it, it's a promising future. But it's like it's the usual thing, George. Is like we always say that like, we'll believe it when we see it. I well, I, th <laughs> I think it, it it will come that uh, farmers will be paid to be more nature friendly farmers. Uh, and I think farmers will will embrace that. Uh, one that you know, every farm has wee nooks and crannies that could be left, and just left to nature, mm -hmm. and that would help the nature habitat and wouldn't decrease their income at all. In fact, maybe help it in the long term. That's it. Yeah. So in the long run, you know what we're looking at is restoring all these natural systems that basically help us reduce the amount of inputs, you know, the artificial inputs into the land. But it's, yeah, I mean, it's a complicated thing. It's, it's hard to fit, it's, fit it's, into a little live stream it's, like this. It's, it's, it's getting the balance right. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do, to get the balance right here. So I've got uh, got quite a few questions, actually. I've, I've not been paying attention. So uh, we've got, uh, Alison's asking how many tenant farmers are specifically here at uh, Mount Stewart. And I think we answered the, are they all livestock? So we did that bit. So how many? So it's five. There, 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 there's five. Right, yeah. uh, and yes, they're they're all livestock. Uh, four of them are livestock. Bring livestock onto the farm. One is just uh, like spring wheat to take the sedge off. Yeah. Uh, who we got next? So, um, do, 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 do. Uh, what year did Nash Trust take over the property? So on paper it was 2014, wasn't 2014. it? And then sort of yeah. 2015, we were sort of on the ground as the Ranger yeah. team. So, so George technically was bought with the estate. <laughs> I, I, I was the rock penny. 
I don't know whether there was much luck on it, but it was, that was it. I came across nothing yet. One of the things we recognised as as you know the the new owners is that is that there's it's all the knowledge that's locked up in your head, George. You know, thirty yeah. plus yeah. years here on the farm, yeah. you know where all the pipes are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing, and, yeah. and of course yeah. the the experience that comes with with that 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 background um, to help us on the journey, and, and obviously he's an integral part of the community here uh, within the the Arts Peninsula, and. You said it at the start, George. It's, it's about relationships, and it you know, is, it's a really yeah. important thing. Mm -hmm. So I've I've really enjoyed working with George over the last four or five years five now, years isn't now, it? Yeah. 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 So I started in May 2015, and that was mm -hmm. when sort of the the team was put on the ground. Yeah. Um, and well, the place has been going since then. Um, you're still my mate, aren't you? I am. <laughs> we haven't fallen out yet. No. Yeah. So so um, we're going to pick up some of these other questions here. Um, da -da -da. Oh, Jane says the cereal leaf beetles, which are quite a few. There you go. That's the, one of the problem species. Yeah. Um, Jimmy's asking, do any he do we do any hedge laying instead of putting fences in? So one of the things here at Mount Stewart is is this hedge here is one of only th three, four yeah. hedges on the entire estate. So so the landscape domain was all about these big block plantings of woodland. Um, however. The intention would be is that this hedge, when it reaches the appropriate size, age, and condition, would be laid. Um, we'd probably keep a few standards coming up for it. Um, that, that's that's the rough plan. And there's 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 other the, the other probably main hedge rows probably the one over to Stuart's Hill. There. Yeah, Stuart's Hill was a replant, wasn't it? That, that one was a replant of it. And then we've got the original ditch boundary walls over yeah. at the South Moor. Um, there's very few hedges here. Yeah. I, I wanted uh, over the years to put more hedges in, but the government wouldn't let me because it was a parkland environment. So they said there was no hedges in that area, so I wasn't allowed. So this is still a restriction that applies today, actually, um, because Mount Stewart is uh, like it's a historical parkland. Um, under those designations means that the actual sort of landscape layout mm -hmm. cannot be amended too much yeah. now this this one in particular we looked back at old records of the area and we did see evidence of a corridor through yeah. here so we were able to do this one so that's one of the one of the interesting challenges. so so here's an example where the heritage actually restricts us mm -hmm. from doing really I good stuff for right. yeah, yeah. the environment and wildlife yeah. um so Mavis says enjoying today's walk very informative well thank you very much mm -hmm. Mavis so I suppose we'll probably start winding up towards the end here let's check the time um, 12 o'clock, there you go. Blimey, it flies by, doesn't it, George? So we'll, we'll perhaps go over to the old aerodrome pad and look down at the, um, the little red trail section of parkland and probably finish up talking about why we need to perhaps graze more of our woodlands in the future. So trying to avoid the old dead air here, um, talking on our way down. If you've got any other questions, get them in right now and uh, we'll, we'll get them answered for you. And of course, if I've missed anything through the comments, I'll jump on the comments uh, over lunch and, and answer any of the other questions. But if you've got anything burning that you want to ask uh, myself or George, or just in general, I uh, would love to field your questions. So get them in the comments box. So Jill Forsyth says, very interesting. I used to work for hedgerow management and field margins as a source for benefits. Working, all right, so, so that was your career. So were you, did you do any hedge laying yourself, Jill? Um, be interesting. Yeah, it's, it's something I've never seen a nope. huge amount of here in Northern Ireland and yeah. Ireland as a whole. Um, but where I come from, I'm, I'm from Somerset originally, and you know that was basically your staple boundary maintenance was all really yeah. nice, well laid hedgerows. So I'm kind of I'm probably a bit rusty if I try to lay a hedge now. Um, but certainly around the wider Strangford Lock area, the, the Strangford team are working on some of the. Uh, hedgerows that have been replanted and they lay hedgerows around the area as well. So Kelly Nether um, actually has uh, a hazel coppice. What are we looking at here? Oh, just looking at that chicory there, now coming up through in the... The, the smaller yeah, bit yeah, looks yeah, like yeah, it, yeah, yeah, and then the, the pink yeah. flowers are the campion, so that's yeah. the red cow. And then you've got yeah. Oxide Daisy, There's which plenty, is plenty coming up that there. one there. So, so this was a reso... Uh, last year. So this is just a little sort of, it was a really rank ryegrass, uh, was, uh, dead yeah. dead patch here. And that, we had a little extra in our flower mix that went into yeah. Flowers Hill and uh, it got sown. There we go. So, let's have a look. This is, uh, this is one of my favorite ash trees. This one is an absolute beast of an ash tree. But George, just stand over there for, for a little bit of scale um, at the tree there, would you? Oh. <laughs> Although George is a big chap. He's, what are you George, you're 6'3"? 
There you go. So just get an idea of this. This ash tree is an absolute cracker of a tree, growing right on the bridge here. And you know, ash is something we'll probably not see in the future with uh, Jalara uh, mash dieback um, ripping its way through the UK and Ireland at the moment. It's looking okay. It's it's a little thin on top, probably from the last few years stressing with the the dry weather. There you go. That's a whole other kettle of fish. Okay, so. I think we'll just finish up with this little section through the parkland bit here. So, so this was one of the old sort of like parkland link screens that would have connected Patson's Wood behind us to the uh, glen, which is mm -hmm. there. Uh, that's the, the folly in there. So we're on the red trail at the moment for all the, the regular visitors. Um, now again, most of the tree cover here has been lost. Um, and of course it's gotten very rank with, with sort of, again, perennial grasses and, and various uh, bramble and stuff. So, so we've had the cattle in here most winters now for, well, I suppose, anything from like five, six weeks or so? I have about, about five, six weeks. I agree, is it? I, uh, and then they're, 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 we, we put them in after lockdown. We found this an opportunity to graze it again because the general public weren't going to walk through here. So we had you know, this dog in here for about a month about the month of March mid to mid April and they were off here about maybe four weeks or so so it's just uh, right so you can see that the, the growth has come back up it's already come up now yeah and it was it was a dry a dry spring relatively speaking which meant that the ground didn't get mushed up too much um, but this is probably one of our challenges so we have all these trails restored and the visitor access but we don't have quite enough of our trails opened and restored yet to be able to do the grazing how we need it to be. So like closing sections so we can graze it. So we're, you know, this was actually an opportunity. So there's, there's one of the positives to celebrate, George. On. Yeah, that, that was one of the positives <laughs> of COVID-19. That's maybe the only that, like, you know, but, uh, yeah. Uh, we have grazed another pathway to, through woodland uh, as well. So, so we used that opportunity when the test was closed. So you can see the remnants of some of the the old trees. That, that's actually an old um, elm uh, stump, that one. And there's a few other oak stumps, and there's a nice sort of a real veteran elm just to, on that top corridor up there. But this would have had, wouldn't have been dense woodland. It would have been sort of what we'd call parkland woodland. Right, parkland. So so you can see the trees, the remaining tree stock just up ahead of us. Quite wide spacing. Um, and what what one of our future plans is obviously to get this particular area restocked with uh, as parkland style so they'd, they'd, they'd go in with sort of full guard protection around them so we'd still be able to graze it and then we'd thin that canopy spread down to perhaps every every 15 maybe in every 20 meters there'd be a tree and that allows them to fill out into this sort of parkland style specimen style tree but enough light comes down so you still have pretty good grass growth and that means you can still graze it so i think that's probably us winding up and um, we'll just pick up any more questions that have come through there's a lovely little bit of lesser stitch wart just here as well, just uh, covered in little hoverflies and, and so on. So we've got... Da -da -da. Okay, so kind of ask, what's your favourite type of tree? Well, what's yours, George? Beach. Beach, like beach a beach. Tree, right? yeah. We've got a lot of beach trees Strong here. Strong and we? robust and nice looking trees. Yeah, yeah oh, they, they definitely are. <sighs> Asking me what kind of tree it is, is it's kind of like, oh geez, I can't decide to be honest. Um, I think as I was talking about ash just a moment ago, just because it's fresh in my mind, I'd say probably say ash actually. Um, you know, it's a really concerning that we're going to lose the ash trees. This is a big ash in front of us here from our landscape. Um, they're really nice open form trees, so they make very nice uh, woodland pasture underneath them. Ash woodland is, is really kind of quite light and airy, so you get lots of lots of different plants on the woodland floor. So so beach, beautiful, but it does shade out, just a just as a little challenge to the beach. <laughs> and of course, oak woodland is you know that's fantastic too. So yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, uh, Connor. Uh, what have we got here? So we've got Jimmy Graham also asks, um, have you noticed much difference in the last nine weeks with people not walking about? Um, for example, like plants growing and wildlife. I know I have. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, well, it has now. Uh, well, it's been quieter anyway, uh, <laughs> certainly, but uh, I think right enough. Well, I suppose it's, it's a time of year when plants do flourish, and we've noticed that very much so. Uh, it, yeah, like uh, primroses, I think there's more primroses this year than ever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, those prim primroses, they, 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 they quite often appear in the middle of the paths. So, so when they're starting to grow, they, they might get trampled out quite quickly. But obviously this year they haven't. Um, I've certainly noticed there's, there's less little sort of desire lines going off into the woods. We have our badger trails and things like that. And I think people sort of don't necessarily realise you know, we have the keep to the trails for a reason. It doesn't take much to trample bluebell woodlands. You know, just pretty much one footprint will pretty much trample out that plant very quickly. And then of course you get the ground compaction from people keeping walking on, on, on the plants as well. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. I'm certainly seeing more wildlife has definitely come into areas at all times of day. So like there's there's pretty much always a heron on on the lake um, at the gardens at the moment. Um, there were four four cattle egret down at the Brackish Marsh, which is just behind there. Um, most of the morning last week, um, and of course usually once once daylight comes and we get some of our first visitors, they're they're off elsewhere. So it's been really interesting. Um, you know, I guess it's pros and cons. It has been bittersweet. Um, you know, I've enjoyed having most of the estate to you know ourselves and. Um, but at the same time, you know, our role is also about helping people connect with the outdoors and, and encouraging that access as well. So, so yeah, I mean, it's pros and cons, as with everything, balances yeah. to be struck. Mm -hmm. So, any final closing words for yourself, George? Have you got anything you'd like no, to say? Uh, How was this uh, live stream for you? Uh, pardon? <laughs> How was the live stream for you? Oh, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why the other end will be all right, but it's, it's all right in my end. <laughs> and I just wish everybody stay safe and hope everybody's well. Especially those who are volunteering with us. I haven't seen you for, for what, eight, nine weeks now? It's great. Uh, no, so don't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to seeing you very shortly. Yeah, I think that's that's the same for me as well. Like, I really miss having the team here. Um, we, you know, we, we're all working towards a bigger goal here, which has been fantastic. Um, Jimmy's just saying about the, the flowers up at the causeway. So, yeah, um, without all the people tramping on the causeway, the sea thrift growing between all the stones has been... Uh, going I mean, it looks fantastic if, if anybody hasn't seen it go to the giants causeways um twitter or facebook you can, you can see some of the imagery of, of the stones um we've absolutely covered in all the the sea pink or sea thrift flowers that, that's there and becky says the hedge is growing really well it certainly is <laughs> so yeah becky also helped plant this hedge um back in 2015 16 winter i think it was martin thank you for watching it's good to see you and uh what does that say there we go <laughs> Cheers guys, um, thank you for joining us and um, we've got two more scheduled live streams coming up so the next one is next Tuesday of course and then one on the second. Um, I haven't confirmed what we're doing next week yet, I'm hoping it's going to be out actually on the shoreline of the lock um, looking at a few things and then I think we'll be back to the gardens with um, our assistant head gardener uh, Ollie who is out of furlough now where Jonathan's gone into furlough to give him a bit of a rest and um, Ollie's coming out of furlough and he's now uh, working as well. So, so we'll have a different person for the garden this time, so a different lens, different angle, and perhaps we'll look a little bit uh, more in detail at, at some of the, the real sort of interesting things. Because like last time was a bit of a general overview of, of sort of where we're at and the challenges we've faced. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there. So thank you everybody, um, really good time. George looking really yeah. contemplative right. in the background there. Yeah. So thank you everybody and we'll see you next week and obviously our daily Mount Stewart moments will be coming out as, as, as much as we can. Cheers everybody!